Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And we are here with another R. Kelly update. Um, I had started to do a video for you guys the other day, and it was just going to cover some um, motions. And one was a response to um, Steve Greenberg's motion um, that he had submitted last month where he, re he was asking the Northern District of Illinois to preserve any law enforcement notes or memos um, with people that they had interviewed. And so the, um, the feds responded to that motion. And so I have that for you and I am going to cover that. And then I was also going to go over a motion that Steve Greenberg filed the other day in the Eastern District of New York. Um, it was a second motion to the one that I read to you guys um, a few days ago. So that was going to be that. I had all my notes prepared. I had the motions ready to read. But then I said to myself, oh, I'll wait and do the video because he has court on Thursday and it shouldn't be a big deal. And then I can just enter the information about the court date, um, the hearing, give you guys an update. Well, honey, it just seems like all hell broke loose today, okay? And if this doesn't let you know or convince you that this is just something demonic going on, that this is nothing but the devil, okay? And the more shenanigans that take place, the more I believe that he is going to walk away from this. And so just start out with how the day started. So, you know, he was supposed to have his hearing, I think, at 9 o'clock. Um, I went online, you know, trying to find YouTubers who were actually at the court hearing. I remember that um, Kevin Terrell, DJ Tyson, um, said that he was going to Chicago and he was going to be there. So I go to his channel and he was doing a live and he was saying that he had been removed from the courthouse because he was, he had gone live in the lobby and I'm sitting there saying to myself, now he knows he cannot, you can't record in a federal courtroom or not courtroom, but in the federal courthouse, because even when the reporters are um, texting or either tweeting, you know, giving us like these little play by play updates on what's going on in the hearing, they aren't, you know, recording what's happening in the hearing. They're sitting there and they're tweeting. And actually, I don't even think they're supposed to be having any kind of device out at all. Um, they're supposed to just take written notes. They're not supposed to be doing anything while they're in the federal courthouse. Um, the, the um, you know, Cook County Courthouse may have different rules about that type of thing. But I know when Harvey Weinstein was in court, um, having his trial a couple of weeks ago, there was no recording devices allowed in the courtroom. They couldn't even have phones on to send out tweets or to text anybody. They didn't allow any of that. And I don't think his case was a federal case. I think his case was a state case. And they weren't even allowed to do any of that. And even um, Court TV, they basically had to get the transcripts from uh, Weinstein's case. Like, as the court reporter was doing the transcripts, they would get the information and then they would do voiceover reenactments of what happened in the courtroom for their um, viewing audience to kind of get a grasp of what was going on. So you're not allowed to take, um, you know, cameras and all that. You know, you're not allowed to be recording in federal courthouses. And then I think in Georgia, a, a couple of months ago, remember um, Kevin McCall, who has the daughter by um, the model and actress Eva, Eva, um, I can't think of Eva's last name, it begins with an M, but you guys remember her from America's Next Top Model, Marcel or Marseille or something like that. But anyway, he ended up getting arrested 
because he was asked to put his um, phone away and stop recording in the courthouse. And this was before they had even gotten into the courtroom. He was just out there and the guy, the bailiff asked him to put the phone down. He wouldn't and he ended up getting into a physical altercation. So no recording in um, courthouses and definitely not federal courthouses. But anyway, Kevin said that um, the one of the marshals or the bailiff or security, whoever it was, came up to him and um, he had to go upstairs, give his identification. They ran his information and he was giving a citation and um, he has to appear in court or something. I don't know what the citation was all about. But anyway, um, so he was out of the courthouse. He couldn't um, you know, go back in for the rest of the day. So then he um, hooked up with this other YouTuber who I'm not really familiar with, Dabrowski or something like that. But he hooked up with him and he was going back to his car to do something. So anyway, they ended up going back to the courthouse. Something happened. I turned off the live. But when I came back to kind of like figure out what was going on, the um, Jason Misner is a reporter for the, um, I believe it's the Chicago Tribune. And so he had posted on Twitter that there was an altercation or a near altercation at the courthouse and that there was a lady who had to pull one of the guys away that the marshals um, came down and responded and um, you know broke everything up. But now the marshals were on alert. And stuff so was like, oh my God, like was that Kevin and the other YouTuber? Like what is going on? So I went back over to his page. And so then people were starting to say uh, that it was actually Dana J and Shabazz. And you guys remember Shabazz is the guy that's putting together this documentary called The Precedence, which I'm going to talk about more later on as stuff was steadily unfolding throughout the day. And so um, basically in the hearing, <laughs> what happened was Steve Greenberg decided to withdraw his motion um, to request bond that um, you know R. Kelly be released on house arrest. And so he said that the reason that he did that was, you know, what I've been telling you guys all along that everybody kept telling me wasn't correct. But he basically said what I've been saying, and that is if he was to get bond, the New York people would come and get him and take him to New York. And then he's even more so worried about that happening because um, during the hearing today, they found out that the... Um, so the Northern District of Illinois had a superseding indictment that came out that I read to you guys a couple of weeks ago where um, I believe they dropped Lisa Van Allen and they added another person, a minor number six to the indictment. Well, today in court, they said that they had served a search warrant on a warehouse or storage or something that R. Kelly owns and that they recovered over a hundred devices. And so they're going through these devices um, looking for evidence and that um, once they're finished with their investigation, there may be another superseding indictment and they um, will be adding another um, alleged victim. I, and, um, Texas Black Diamond got on me <laughs> earlier today because y'all know I'm like they're accusers, they're not victims. But I was repeating what the um, Jason Messner guy was saying, and I said victims, and she's like, "No, Miss Tracy, they're they're not victims. They're alleged victims. They're accusers. Don't call them victims. So not victims." But the um, the feds are saying that they may be adding another person once they go through all these devices. And so after, oh, what else? Oh, and then they said because of all of this, they were going to um, postpone the trial. So instead of the trial starting on April 27th, it's now set for October 13th. And then Steve Greenberg also said that he doesn't believe that the Chicago case is even going to start. Remember, it was supposed to start on September 14th. And so now he's saying that he believes that that case is also going to be um, delayed because of something, you know, coming up with that case. 
And so it was like, oh my God. So then Daryl McDavid and um, June Brown, I guess they were there or their attorneys were there. And so, you know, um, I don't know if I read the indict the um, motion to you guys, but Daryl McDavid is requesting a speedy trial. And so the judge was ruling on his request for the speedy trial. But now that they have pushed it out to October, Daryl McDavid is like, look, my life is on hold, okay? And I am not going to wait to October. I want a speedy trial. I want my trial to start April 27th. Um, that's what we've been planning for. So the judge gave them a few days to think it over and then told them to file a formal request stating that they want the speedy trial and they want the trial to start on April 27th. And then he will rule and let them know. Um, June Brown's attorney said he is okay, you know, with waiting until whenever R. Kelly goes on trial. He's cool. He's okay. And so I had an article here I was going to read to you guys. Like I said, this day has been on fire. So um, this is from ABC Eyewitness News. It says, um, oh, and then R. R. Kelly was also there to plead on the new um, superseding indictment that came out. And of course, he pled not guilty. Um, he said he is not fold, folding for these people, no matter how many tricks they pull out their bag. And so basically, the article says, singer R. Kelly appeared in federal court in Chicago Thursday and entered a not guilty plea um, to an updated federal indictment. It says the 13 count indictment includes abuse allegations involving a new accuser and multiple counts of pornography. Um, the indictment says the accuser met Kelly around 1997 or 1998 when she would have been 14 or 15 years old. It says Kelly engaged in contact or acts around that time and several years before she turned 18. At the hearing, the judge uh, rescheduled the trial for October 13th. The original date had been set for April 27th. <clears throat> and says, um, then talks about some of the other charges he's facing and um, just some back history on the story. And I thought I had another article. <clears throat> okay, and then this is from NBC5 Chicago. Um, it says, <clears throat> I'm sorry guys, I should have got some water before I started doing this video. Um, it says, in a 10-page filing Monday, um, federal prosecutors fought against efforts uh, by performer R. Kelly to obtain new information about the evidence the government intends to use against him. Um, Kelly faces multiple accounts, blah, blah, blah. Um, Kelly had demanded a court order seeking the investigative notes of agents, complaint, complainants, against those agents and production of so-called Brady material or evidence which is favorable to his defense. But prosecutors say they are already preserving the agent's notes that they have already provided Kelly's defense with some so-called Brady evidence and have given assurances that they will provide more if it is discovered. They also know that um, they are not in a position to provide information on weaknesses in witness testimony because they do not know which witnesses will eventually be called. The government does not anticipate that the trial will involve the testimony of many law enforcement witnesses. The prosecutors wrote, most of the government's witnesses will be victims and witnesses with firsthand knowledge of the defendant's crimes. Um, Kelly had also asked for the records of any assistance, financial or otherwise, which had been provided to potential witnesses. But prosecutors said they knew of no such assistance save for unnamed benefits, which had been provided to two witnesses by the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Kelly um, then talks about him being arrested in July and then goes on to say that he has denied um, all these allegations against him. 
So, you know, they gave out, um, you know, just a little tidbits of what was going on, um, you know, about him pleading not guilty, about the trial being delayed, about Darren McDavid, blah, blah, blah. So I go back over to YouTube, you know, trying to find out like, well, what happened with this altercation y'all were talking about earlier? And then I see um, DJ Tyson was at Tavern on the Rush with um tavern on rush was which is a restaurant and so he's sitting there at the table and he had this little look on his face and then he picks up the phone and then he scans it and um why was he sitting between the two fake kelly sisters so i was like okay well that's an interesting pairing going on right there so i can't wait to see his video see what he you know what he has to say about that so then I'm like, okay, let me go ahead and get this video together. Then I find out that Shabazz has re has um put out his final trailer for this docu. I, I don't know. I can't even call it a documentary after what he put out today. So he puts out this um trailer on Facebook, and you guys can go to it. I'll put the link below so you can go watch the nonsense yourself. But basically, it is of Azriel, and so she, one is a recorded phone call with Azriel talking to a federal agent, and I'm like, okay, so we sitting here recording conversations with federal agents. Do the federal agent know that, they're, that this call is being recorded and that it's going to appear in the documentary? And so that right there let y'all know that this is some what's that word full of y'all know i don't curse but i'm about to curse today okay full of fucking nigger tree that's going on right now okay so she's being recorded and she is on the phone with a federal agent telling the federal agent that r kelly had her record herself not that he was recording her but had her record herself um taking a dump a crap shitting in a cup and that she then um ate the ate the feces that just came out her behind okay and i'm like okay well did she put some chocolate syrup on top of it did she sprinkle some sugar on it did she have a spoon was she eating it with a hand can i get some details on how you was eating your own feces out of a cup and when I tell you this girl wasn't cringing, she wasn't gagging, she wasn't emotional, she wasn't crying, you know, there was no tremble in her voice where she was just telling this horrific thing that had happened to her. Like none of that. She was talking to this federal agent on this phone with Shabazz recording her the same as I'm sitting here talking to y'all right now. Okay, and so I'm like, what kind of nonsense is this? So after the phone conversation, then she has a recording, but now it's a picture of R. Kelly on the screen. So we don't get to actually see her having this conversation, but basically it's like a um, closed caption bylines are going up on what she's saying. And so she's on the phone and she's basically talking mad trash to r kelly like you brought this on yourself you know and when you make it to trial if you even make it to trial like i guess you think he gonna kill himself or something <laughs> you know why he in jail and so the whole while she talking all this trash with mad attitude mind you he's supposedly now it didn't sound like r kelly to me but other people seem to have thought that it was him so he's supposedly crying on the other end of the phone saying, Papa, I love you. I love you. I love you. And she just going off about, you know, um, when all this go down, he's going to regret everything he did to her. And, you know, he lied to her. He fooled her. He made her think. I was like, oh my God, are you serious right now? So I'm watching this doggone video and y'all know I'm supposed to be on a social media fast. I'm not even supposed to be on social media <laughs> right now, but I said I was going to try and do a couple of videos since I had been, you know, out for a while. And so I'm watching this just like in total shock. Like I cannot believe that this is really, really going down. And so then I got to thinking, 
And some other people were saying on Twitter and, you know, other places, I'm reading comments and stuff about all of this shenanigans that's going on. And so it's like, okay, so when she, because also in the video that Shabazz um, is recording, it, you know, shows them packing up the stuff from the apartment. And so the um Steve Greenberg did a news conference and I'm going to drop that in this video so you can hear the entire news conference but he was basically saying that these devices that they allegedly found in the storage unit was the exact same storage unit that the New York um Eastern District of New York had already served a search warrant on this storage unit so he didn't understand how they how the north how the northern district of Illinois has went into the storage unit six seven months after the eastern district of New York had already served a search warrant and came up with a hundred devices. So like, did the New York people not see all these devices? And so when they're saying devices, I'm thinking cell phones, tablets, computers, laptops you know, anything that would record something. And so I guess New York left all the stuff in there for the Chicago people to go and find. And then it was like, if New York had already served the search warrant, why, what triggered Chicago to then, or Illinois to then go back and serve another search warrant? And so now the consensus is that Azriel probably then made these recordings, then doctored up some stuff. And, you know, just the house of cards, I just believe in my heart, is going to tumble down on Azriel, on Angelo, on all of them. It's going to crash down on them. And so I'm thinking that they have planted stuff, and other people have said the same thing, that they planted stuff in that warehouse. Like she probably had access to the warehouse. She done made these videos and they have gone in there and, and planted these videos in there. And if Steve Greenberg can prove that she had a key to the warehouse, then um, any evidence that they found in that search will probably get tossed out because, you know, he'll be able to prove that it was tampered with. But um, Steve Greenberg was like, if there was anything in that uh, warehouse, that uh, New York would have said something. They would have been in the discovery. And that, um, you know, Azrael, well, he didn't say Azrael because at the time we didn't know who the other person was. But now we figured out that this new person that they're trying to add to the Illinois indictment is actually Azrael. So, child... I'm just, I mean, I can laugh about it now, you know, as I'm talking about it, the absurdity of it, like, like these people are stupid, like they are retarded, okay? But like earlier today when I'm like doing my research and looking at this stuff, I was like so devastated. I was like, Lord, but it just goes back to, and I think it was a guy named Marshall that was on, um, Shabazz's um where he posted the video and he was basically saying like or it might not have been Marshall it might have been somebody else um oh that's that's this is what Marshall said <laughs> okay so Marshall uh was confronting Shabazz and he was basically saying why were you at the restaurant with DJ Tyson and the Kelly sisters and so I was like hold up <laughs> like wait a minute what is going on? And so he basically, um, I think um, Shabazz came back and said that he was with them. And so now people are like, okay, what's up with DJ Tyson? Like, why was he there with them? And then people are like, okay, so was it all like the whole Dana J and Shabazz getting into it in the courthouse? Was that a setup for filming? And was the whole, you know, the whole um, somebody calling and saying that um, DJ was filming in the lobby? Was that a setup for Shabazz to get footage? You know, why were they all together at um, Tavern on Rush? Like, so now people are really starting to think, like, what is going on? You guys know I don't like getting caught up in the drama and the back and forth. So I'm just reporting to y'all 
what all went on in this crazy, crazy day. And like, this is why I be trying to stay over here by myself. Though it's only like two or three, um, well, actually not even two or three. I watch Texas Black Diamond um, and I watch Arissa. And then I just happen to go over there. And today, you know, every now and then I'll, you know, see what DJ Tyson is up to, but I don't go over there on a regular basis. And this is why, because <laughs> I don't like having to come back and report on, you know, this kind of stuff that's going on. But anyway, yeah, that's what happened. So now let's, um, I'm going to go ahead and drop the press Here's conference for you guys. And then I'm going to the um, read going these to um, to motions to you. Evidence they come up with. So uh, you're left with the choice to do you go to trial uh, within a couple of weeks of getting that information or you get a legitimate date. So he's disappointed from that perspective, but still very uh, optimistic. Right. We don't, we don't have any information on who this person is. When we get the information, we'll look into it. We're confident in our case. We're confident that Mr. Kelly is going to walk free. Well, they can, you know, people come out of the woodwork. I know that uh, when Kim Fox made her, her plea for people to come forward, there were hundreds of people who called. There were hundreds of people they determined were, were false accusers. When they brought the state chargers, there was no one new. There is no one new. They're not going to find anyone new. And we'll go to trial and, and we'll challenge the evidence. Can you comment again about the search warrant? <coughs> about what we, do we don't. So the way it works in a search warrant is they get a search warrant from a judge without anyone knowing about it. It's a secret proceeding. Even though he has lawyers, there's a court case, we don't know when they get a search warrant. We know where they search. We know that there's nothing incriminating there. They're not going to find anything. But they're going to take their time, I'm sure, and do their forensic analysis and then come to the same conclusion. Again, we don't know. So they'll, they'll be disclosing that materials in the next 30 to 60 to 90 days. As we said, that's already been searched by New York, to our belief. And, and a lot of this stuff seems to be stuff that might relate to recording of concerts and, and things of that nature. So we're in the dark just like you are. Right. One of the marshals said that uh, Kelly never leaves his house. He wasn't forced to. I mean, have you looked up the road? I think he uh, stays to himself. You know, when you're in when you're in jail, you every time you talk to someone, you put yourself in danger of that person claiming that you said something that you didn't say, but it doesn't stop them. And if they have a video or something showing interaction, you you just set yourself up for trouble. Uh, he's a high-profile inmate. He has to stay in his cell for safety and uh, and for his own peace of mind. Speaking of that, why did you drop the motion to reconsider bond or bail? Well, because it just wasn't viable. I mean, we have an order from a court in New York saying that he's not going to be released. So even if Judge Leinenweber would do what we expect he might do, which would be to release Mr. Kelly, the New York judge would immediately make him go in custody in New York. So it really doesn't practically make any sense for us to pursue the motion here. Yeah. Is there, do you guys plan to pursue it in New York? No, we've, ar we've already pursued that motion. It's been denied by the court in New York. So really this present bond hearing motion, in this case, is kind of vestige of what happened on the docket in the case months ago. It really wasn't ever today supposed to be a legitimate bond hearing. Right. Sorry, just to clarify, the storage facility was, that was recently searched by the law enforcement here had been searched before by that's our, our belief is that this is the same facility that was searched before. We don't know of some other storage facility. But by law enforcement, you mentioned by New York. By New York, so right. By the FBI. When, when, uh, when Robert was arrested on the New York charges, they executed a search warrant on his condominium and also on the uh, storage facility that he had here in Illinois. Uh, and we're not aware of any other facility, no other condominium, no studio or anything like that. I'd point out that to this day, New York certainly hasn't given us anything indicating that they found any incriminating evidence of any kind whatsoever. Do you know when? They said recently. Do you know when they went back? It's the same storage facility, so you don't know when they went back? No. Okay. I, I mean, I have a general idea, but yeah. it doesn't really matter. They did it. Yeah. I know when you're they all excited it, about matter. it, but there's no reason, no expectation on our part that there's right. anything that corroborates the allegations in the storage unit. It's already been done. 
they've already went through that well before. So we're not anticipating there's going to be anything incriminating from the search, other than there's a lot of materials in there in terms of recording devices for concerts and things of that nature. So there may be a large volume of data, but there's no reason to believe it's relevant to this case or even to the New York case at this point. Right, they're gonna, they're gonna get all the computers, they're gonna go through them, they're gonna find a lot of uh, music, maybe they'll release an album, who knows. Anything else? Thanks for your time. Oh. <laughs> Mike Leonard, L-E-O-N-A-R-D, for Mr. Kelly. Steve Greenberg, Common Spelling. Here's another article that I um, wanted to read to you guys, and this was actually um, Jason Meisner. I think he left court. He went and did an article. And so it says, Singer R. Kelly's trial next month in Chicago's federal court has been postponed until October after prosecutors revealed Thursday that investigators very recently executed a search warrant in the case and seized at least 100 electronic devices. Um, the information was about the recent raid came out during a routine arraignment for Kelly on a superseding indictment filed last month that added allegations that he abused another victim uh, for four years starting 1997. Um, the location of the raid was not disclosed. Um, but like I told you guys, um, Steve Greenberg already said that it was at... Um, it was at a warehouse or something that he had out near O'Hare Airport. And it says um, the information about the recent raid came out during, okay, um, in telling U.S. District Judge Harry Lineweber that they did not object to delaying the trial, which had been set for April 27th. Prosecutors said they needed time to search the iPads, cell phones, and hard drives seized via the warrant. Assistant U.S. Attorney Angel Knoll also told the judge prosecutors intended to supersede the indictment again in the near future to, quote, add yet another victim, end quote, to the allegations of abuse against R. Kelly. Um, Kelly's lawyers, meanwhile, said that Kelly's scheduled trial in the fall on abuse charges brought in Cook County is also expected to be postponed. That could mean that Kelly would first um, face trial in July in New York, where the singer is charged in federal court in Brooklyn with racketeering conspiracy. Kelly, 53, who has been held without bond since his arrest on the federal charges last July, appeared in Lime Weber's packed 19th floor courtroom Thursday dressed in an orange jail jumpsuit. Um, he kept his hands clasped behind his back and did not speak during the 25-minute hearing. His lawyers entered a not guilty plea to the superseding indictment on his behalf. In the hallway before the hearing began, dozens of spectators and supporters lined up to get a seat in the courtroom. A fight almost broke out between two men with one threatening loudly to, quote, kick your a blank blank end quote, before a woman he was with dragged him away. A courthouse security team quickly moved in to monitor the crowd. Kelly was originally charged in a 13-count indictment in July with conspiring with two former employees, longtime manager Daryl McDavid and former employee Milton June Brown, um, to rig his 2008 pornography trial in Cook County by paying off witnesses and victims to change their stories. The indictment also alleged Kelly and his co-defendants paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to, rec um, to recover tapes before they fell into the hands of prosecutors. The additional charges alleged that Kelly um, met minor six circa 1997 when she was about 14 or 15. Um, he abused her until about December 2000, the charges alleged. And so, and you guys know they're saying that this person is actually... Lisa Van Allen's friend, and they call her, um, they give her some name that sounds like a Spanish name, but then earlier they were saying it was her friend Beverly, so I don't know if Beverly and this person are the same person. 
And so it says, lawyers for R. Kelly challenged New York charges that stem from 1943 law on sexually transmitted diseases. And that's what I'm going to read to you guys in that motion um, that he filed. It says, Kelly, whose full name is Robert Sylvester Kelly, faces a separate racketeering conspiracy indictment in U.S. District Court in New York, alleging he identified underage girls attending his concerts and groomed them for later abuse. Um, the singer is charged in four separate indictments in Cook County, blah, blah, blah. Additional charges are also pending in Minnesota, blah, blah, blah. Um, Kelly has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Um, at Thursday's hearing, um, McDavid's attorney told Line Weber they still want to go to trial in April and may formally demand that his case proceed without his co-defendants. And um, so I already told you guys that information that he um, said he'd give him a few days for him to file the formal motion if he still wanted to be severed from this case. Um, Steve Greenberg says the raid that prosecutors were talking about today took place at a storage facility near O'Hare that holds um, Kelly's tour equipment. It's stuff like the iPad that the sound guys uses. Um, they aren't going to find anything. Also from today's um, Kelly hearing, the judge ordered prosecutors to notify defense of any, any quote, mental, psychiatric, or drug abuse records of any individual who may be called in as a witness. Um, the judge will review the documents privately before deciding if they should be turned over. So um, this was filed with the courts on March 2nd, um, United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, um, Eastern Division, um, United States of America versus Robert Sylvester Kelly, um, also known as R. Kelly. Um, it says government's consolidated response to defendants on um, discovery motions. It says the United States of America by its attorney, John R. Lausch Jr., United States attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, respectfully submits the following consolidated response Two defendants discovery motions on um, one introduction defendant has filed three separate discovery related motions which taken together seek a court order requiring the government to preserve investigative notes of law enforcement agents um, docket number 83 produce various items defendant contains are discoverable under Brady and Giglio docket number 85 and produce records of complaints against law enforcement agents docket number 87. Given the government's ongoing adherence to its discovery obligations of defendant's motions should be denied. Two, the law. Discovery in this case, like all criminal cases in the district, is governed by statute, federal and local rules of criminal procedure and case law. Um, see example 18 USC code 3500. Um, then it just gives like a whole bunch of codes and they, um, Brady versus Maryland 373, um, Giglio versus United States 405. Um, Brady is from 1963 and the Giglio case is from 1972. Um, it says under Brady, the government has a duty to disclose any information in its possession that is favorable to the defense and material either to guilt or punishment. 375, I'm sorry, 373. U.S. at 88, um, information favorable to the defense includes evidence which, quote, would tend to escapade the defendant or reduce the penalty, ID at 87, and evidence regarding the reliability or credibility of a government's witness, see um, Giglio 405 U.S. at 154 through 55. And then three law enforcement notes, docket number 83. It says defendant has asked um, this court to enter an order requiring all governmental law enforcement officials, including state and local law enforcement agencies and personnel involved in the investigation to this matter to preserve their notes and reports, docket number 83. 
Uh, with respect to notes of federal law enforcement agents, the government has already taken steps to preserve such evidence. Indeed, in its Rule 16 letter to Defense Counsel dated August 2, 2019, the government already told Defense Counsel that it would preserve such notes. Upon receipt of the present motion to preserve notes, the government reaffirmed to the federal law enforcement officials involved in the case that they are obligated to retain their notes. Courts in this district regularly deny a defendant's motion for a court order requiring law enforcement officials to reserve notes where the government represents that it has informed law enforcement officials to do so. United States versus Trotman 572, blah, 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 blah. And that's a case out of Illinois from 2008. Um, then it has in parentheses, denying as moot defendant's motion to preserve drafts of interview notes and investigative reports where the government represented that it had already instructed its agents to do so. And then it gives a couple of more cases um, showing that they have done that already in the past. Um, there is no discovery dispute with respect to this issue, and the defendant's motion unnecessarily injects the court into discovery when there is no specific issue for the court to address on this point. See Local Rule 16.1A2. With respect to state and local law enforcement officers, the government has no authority to require those independent sovereigns to preserve notes. Um, see United States versus Olison. Um, that was a case from 1995. Um, and actually, Judge Leinen Weber proceeded over that case. Okay, so he made the ruling. And so it says defendant cites no authority otherwise. Um, accordingly, the government respectfully requests that the court deny defendant's motion as moot with respect to federal law enforcement officers and to deny the motion as without authority with respect to state and local law enforcement officers. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me that federal agents are required to preserve their notes, but the state and local officers, the federal agent, which federal government supersedes local government, so they're not allowed to tell state and federal agents whose information you're going to be using in this case, um, they're not required to preserve their notes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> number four, Brady and Giglio materials, docket number 85. It says, defendant asks this court to enter an order requiring the government to immediately disclose and produce any all previously undisclosed evidence that is favorable and is material in any way to any of the issues related to defendant's guilt or innocent or which bears upon the credibility of the government witness who might testify at trial. Docket number 85, at one, although not cited by defendant, the legal basis for defendant's motion is Brady versus Maryland, favorable evidence that is material in Giglio versus United States, impeachment evidence affecting witness credibility. As explained below, the government has complied with its Brady obligations and will continue to do so. With respect to Giglio material, the government objects generally to defendants' requests as premature and with uh, respect to certain materials sought by the defense. The government rejects to the extent those items do not qualify as Giglio material. A, Brady materials. It is well established in the circuit that the government's acknowledgement of its obligations under Brady and Giglio and assurances to comply with those obligations render defendants motion mute. Um, United States versus Chagoya Morales, um, United States versus Discosla, um, Linen Weber, or oh, some at J. Linen Weber, so it's a different Linen Weber. Um, United States versus Dean. 
So they list um, different cases that support what they're saying. Um, the government correctly notes that courts in this circuit consistently have held that where the government has made assurances it will comply with Giglio and Brady, those assurances are sufficient and defendant's discovery motion was denied as moot. Um, citation omitted. Here in its initial rule 16 production, in its Rule 16 production on August 2nd, 2019, the government provided a detailed letter to counsel in which it explicitly recognized its ongoing obligation to disclose favorable information pursuant to Brady and promised to promptly produce any such evidence that was obtained in the future. Consistent with the letter, with that letter, the government has already produced to the defense the Brady material of which it is aware. If the government becomes aware of additional Brady material, it will promptly disclose such material to the defense as the court is aware defendant is facing a separate indictment in the Eastern District of New York. The government is working with the prosecutors in New York to locate any Brady material in their file that may relate to the case in this district. If any such material is discovered, it will be promptly disclosed to the defense. And this goes back to <laughs> me saying that I believe Jane Doe number two in the New York indictment is Jane Doe number four is that who i said it was that they were yeah that in the previous video <laughs> okay so um b giglio materials um the government objects to defendants request for immediate disclosure of giglio materials production of giglio materials depends on who the government intends to call as a trial witness and the government has not yet finalized this witness list. The trial is still approximately eight weeks away. Nevertheless, in its letter to the defense dated August 2nd, 2019, the government indicated that it would produce Giglio materials one month prior to the trial. Defendant argues that he needs the materials now Quote, in light of the government's proclivity to produce these materials on the eve of trial, docket number 85 at number two. First, one month ahead of trial is hardly considered the eve of trial. Second, the government has already produced much of what defendant seeks, including grand jury transcripts, witness statements, and grants of immunity. Defendant will have plenty of time to review the remainder of these items in the month prior to trial. In addition to its general objection to producing Giglio materials immediately, the government objects to the following three specific requests made by the defendant. A. Mental health and medical records. Defendant asks the court to order the government to disclose and produce all mental, psychiatric, or drug abuse and dependency records of any individual who may be called as witnesses at trial, docket number 85 at number 2. Um, the government has no such records in its possession. To the extent the defendant is requesting that the government affirmatively seek out and obtain such records if they exist, the government objects to such a request. See United States versus Hawk. Rejecting defendant's Brady claim because the government had no obligation to seek out witnesses' privileged psychiatric and medical records from third parties when such records were not in the government's possession. See also Johnson v. Norris, um, holding that there was no Brady violation because state had no obligation to disclose psychotherapy treatment records that were not in its possession. United States versus Bender, um, holding that prosecutor had no obligation to seek out and disclose medical records not in the government's possession. East versus Scott, 55, blah, blah, blah. Finding no Brady violation because government did not possess witnesses' mental health records and holding that prosecutor had no duty to investigate a witness's mental health history. 
Um, prosecutor has no, I'm sorry, United States versus Wilson, um, which showed uh, prosecutor has no duty under Brady to investigate the mental state of its witnesses in order to uncover impeachment evidence for defense. Um, United States versus Michael, denying defendants' requests for mental, psychiatric, or drug abuse records of witnesses. Moreover, even if the government possessed a witness's privileged medical or psychiatric records, disclosure to the defense is not automatic. The proper procedure would be to submit those records to the court for an in-camera review for Brady um, Giglio material. C, Pennsylvania versus Ritchie. Again, the government does not possess any mental, psychiatric, or drug abuse and dependency records of any witness it intends to call on trial. Now, see, that's crazy because how do you have people that are making all these crazy allegations, but I don't know, <laughs> like, like you don't have um, people saying that they saw therapy, that they... I mean, just take Azrael, for instance, who claimed that um, with the boyfriend and she tried to commit suicide and that's how she ended up with R. Kelly. Um, Y'all would want to verify that she really did try to commit suicide and find out what she really told the psychiatrist. And then you got Geronda Pace who claimed she was molested since she was a little girl and all of this led to her wanting to be with R. Kelly. You're not going to um, check out her mental health and make sure she ain't cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Like, I can't believe that they're just taking these people word and that they're not doing any type of evaluation to make sure that they're not crazy and just making all this stuff up. And so it just goes to show the weakness of these cases. And I hope um, Steve Greenberg brings it up in trial if we ever get to trial. So then it says, B, um, witness assistance provided by non-federal authorities. Defendant requests records of um, the government's production of any assistance, financial or otherwise, provided to a witness included by federal, state, or local government actors, docket number 85 at 2. The government has no objection to producing such records relating to federal agencies one month prior to trial, but the government objects to this request to the extent it seeks records relating to state or local agencies. First, with one exception, the government has no such records in its possession with respect to state or local agencies. And second, again, these are separate sovereigns that are not part of the federal prosecution team. Defendant has cited no authority that requires the government to seek out records from separate sovereign governments that are not part of the prosecution team. Um, in other words, there is no affirmation, affirmative duty on the part of the government to seek information not in its possession when it is aware of the existence of that information. Five, law enforcement complaints, docket number 87. Um, defendant has asked um, this court to order the government to produce at least 45 days prior to trial all documents relating to complaints, proceedings, or investigations regarding the truthfulness or veracity of any agent or member of law enforcement who may testify at trial, docket number 87 at number one, um, the court should deny this motion. First, aside from the different time frame for the requested disclosure, this motion seeks the same relief as defendant's motion for immediate production of favorable evidence, Giglio material, see docket 85 at number one. The government's response is the same. It will disclose Giglio material one month prior to trial. As noted above, the government has not yet finalized its list for wit his its witness list for trial, which is still approximately eight weeks away. Moreover, the government does not anticipate that the trial will involve the testimony of many law enforcement witnesses. Most of the government's witnesses will be victims and witnesses with firsthand knowledge of the defendant's crimes. Therefore, the, the volume of Giglio material relating to potential 
testifying law enforcement witnesses would not be great to the extent any materials exist at all. Thus, there is no need to produce those documents abnormally far in advance of trial. So you got people, I guess they say they did their own investigation. No, no, they say they ain't used no law enforcement to investigate any of this stuff. So it says, second, the government objects to defendants' requests for unproven allegations of misconduct by law enforcement officers in addition to his request for records of actual incidents of false testimony or statements. Docket 87, the government has no duty to disclose unproven or unsustained allegations of misconduct by law enforcement officers because such allegations do not constitute Brady or Giglio material. And then they go on to name a bunch of um, court cases supporting why they don't have to give this information. Excuse me, United States versus Dabney, um, United States versus Saltfront, um, the failure to disclose untrustworthy and unsubstantiated allegations, uh, uh, unsubstantiated allegations against a government witness is not a Brady violation. Um, United States versus Sanchez, Galvez, um, Giles versus Maryland, um, Justice Fortes. Concurring in the opinion wrote that there was no obligation to disclose preliminary challenged or speculative information. Uh, see also United States versus Agurs. Accordingly, the government respectfully requests that the court deny um, defendants motion. Um, so in a nutshell, they're basically saying that they have already committed and even began to give um Greenberg and his team the information that they um need for this case and that these other things um they can't give to them because one they have no authority over local law enforcement and then in that third point they're basically saying that the things that Greenberg is requesting one um they don't really have and two um there is no law that say that if a law enforcement um, officer did some unscrupulous act um, that they don't have to tell them. But I would hope in that same notion that you also wouldn't use the information that the law enforcement gave you that you deem to be, um, you know, bad information or a bad act. And maybe there is another law out there that Steve um, Greenberg should have or another case out there he should have cited in his request and maybe he'll come back and respond to that and now let's go over to the um, new motion um, that greenberg um, filed this week in the um, new york case okay and this is for the eastern district of new york and this was filed um, by r kelly's legal team it says defendants motion to strike allegations from count one of the superseding indictment and dismiss the remaining counts. It says defendant Robert Kelly by and through his attorneys respectfully moves this court pursuant to federal rule of criminal procedure 12BV and constitutional principles to strike from count one of the superseding indictment statutory allegations and to dismiss the remaining counts which rely upon an unconstitutional statute in support of this motion, defendant states as follows. One, summary of the charges. Um, defendant is charged with one count of violating section 1962C of the RICO statute relating to six victims, Jane Doe's numbers one through six, and four substantive counts of violating the Mann Act all of which involved only Jane Doe number six. The racketeering is alleged in account one and the violation of the Mann Act in counts two through five. The predicate acts alleged in count one numbers 10 and 12, as well as the Mann Act violation um, alleged in counts two through five rely upon New York statutes, namely New York Public Health Law, 
Section 2307 and New York Penal Law, Section um, 120.20, the public health provides as follows. Section 2307, venereal disease, person knowing himself to be infected, any person who knowing himself or herself to be infected with an infectious venereal disease has sexual intercourse with another shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. Okay, they trying to get him on felony RICO charges and violating the Man Act. And um, New York, and I did um, do some research on that and everything I found said that if you knowingly have sex with somebody, knowing that you had a venereal disease or sexually tr um, transmissible disease, it's a misdemeanor. Okay, so it says the statute is facially unconstitutional. It prohibits sexual intercourse by anybody who has an STD. The definition is vast, ranging from HIV to yeast infections, um, 10 CRR New York 23.1. It includes HPV and scabies. The only requirement is that the individual knows that they have the venereal disease. In other words, it prohibits two consenting adults from having sexual intercourse if either or both know they have an infectious venereal disease. It does not require that the disease be passed on, nor does it allow the consenting adults to have sexual intercourse if the venereal disease is disclosed beforehand. It does not permit the use of a condom or account for modern day suppression drugs. The New York Penal Code defines um, the relevant sexual terms and then it gives um, some links and it talks about HPV, HIV, HSV, which is herpes. Um, 79 million Americans, most in their late teens and early 20s, are infected with um, HPV. Um, it says steps to have safe sex if you have an STD are detailed and he gives a link to the CDC. Um, it says suppression of HIV makes the use of a condom, of a condom avoidable. And then he links to um, NCBI and another website. Um, it says allowing for unprotective sex with HIV. So he says, one, sexual intercourse has its ordinary meaning and occurs upon any penetration, however slight. Um, 2A, oral sexual conduct means conduct between persons consisting of contact, contact between the mouth and the penis, the mouth and the anus, or the mouth and the vulva or vagina. B, anal sexual conduct means conduct between persons consisting of contact between the penis and the anus. New York Penal Law 130.00. Um, this law has a definition of sexual intercourse. Traditionally, that term has been advanced as contact between the male's penis and a woman's vagina. More to the point, because the law separately identifies and defines other forms of sexual contact, it is presumed that the legislature meant for sexual intercourse to mean one thing and to exclude these other forms of contact. A court cannot by implication supply in a statute a provision which it is reasonable to suppose the legislature intended intentionally to omit and the failure of the legislature to include a matter within the scope of an act may be construed as an indication that its exclusion was intended on um, McKinney's Cons Law of New York Book One Statutes um, 74. Um, the maxim expressio unius s exclusio arterius <laughs> is applied, and I did look up what that was. I'll, re I'll flip over and read to I finish this. Um, is applied in the construction of the statute so that where a law expressly describes a particular act, thing, or person to which it shall apply is irrefutable in reference must be drawn that what is omitted or not included was intended to be omitted or excluded. McKinley's Cons Laws of New York, Book One Statutes, 
240. Um, it says Dennis Lane Apartments Incorporated versus Green, um, 2008, New York Slip Op 28328, um, paragraph 321, miscellaneous 3D, blah, 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 goes on. Um, the law does not appear to address or prohibit other forms of sexual contact, such as oral sex or anal sex. Rather, it imposes a complete ban on one form of sexual interaction whenever someone has an infectious venereal disease. It is written as an absolute with the elements being one, that if an individual knows they have an STD and two, they are then prohibited from having sexual intercourse. As written, it is an improper invasion of the right to privacy because it makes it illegal to have private consensual sexual intercourse. Substantive due process prohibits the government from limiting the right to engage in private consensual sexual intercourse without fear of criminal liability. Private sexual contact between consenting adults involves a fundamental liberty interest that triggers a non-deferential review whenever the government seeks to prescribe such contact. The principle in its modern form was expressed by Justice Stevens in his dissent in the now infamous Bowers versus Hardwick decision where a majority of the United States Supreme Court upheld a Georgia statute that criminalized any act of oral sex even between consenting married adults in the privacy of their homes. And so I read this case and this was actually like most of the cases that he's mentioning in this motion really had me confused because they were all about same sex um, relationships and same sex marriages. And where these people, I guess in Georgia, sodomy is um, against the law. And so they basically were saying that because these two men were in a relationship that they were not allowed to have sex because it required putting the penis into the butthole. And so it says our prior cases make two um, propositions abundantly clear. First, the fact that the governing majority in a state has traditionally viewed a particular practice as immoral is not a sufficient reason for upholding a law prohibiting the practice. Neither history nor tradition could save a law prohibiting this. Oh my God. Prohibiting misogenation. M-I-S-C-E-G-E-N-A-T-I-O-N from constitutional attack. Second, individual decisions by married persons concerning the intimacies of their physical relationship, even when not intended to produce offspring, are a form of liberty protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Moreover, this protection extends to intimate choices by unmarried as well as married persons. Bowers versus Hardwick, 478, um, and then Justice Stevens dissented. And then it says in 2003, Justice Stevens' dissent became the view of the majority when the court ruled a similar law was unconstitutional in Lawrence versus Texas. Um, Justice Stevens' analysis, in our view, should have been controlling in Bowers and should control here. Bowers was not correct when it was decided and it is not correct today. Um, Lawrence 539 U.S. 558 578. And it says Lawrence concerned a Texas law that specifically um, criminalized homosexual anal intercourse. Lawrence's invalidation of the statute was not predicated upon any per se constitutional right to engage in the specific acts themselves or any particular sexual act but rather from application of the basic constitutional privacy jurisprudence that has its origin in Griswold versus Connecticut, 381 um, U.S. 479, 
from 1965 and which has since been continuously affirmed most recently in Oberfeld versus, Hod versus Hodges, 135 Supreme Court 2584, and that was from 2015. Collectively, the cases stand for the proposition that private sexual decisions made by consenting adults invariably involve a fundamental liberty interest protected by the due process clause of the 14th amendment one that absolutely shields private sexual conduct from the reach of government intervention that includes intercourse because it is a promise of the constitution that there is a realm of personal life personal liberty, which the government may not enter. And that was also from the Lawrence case. Lawrence is now regarded as the bedrock case establishing the right to sexual privacy. Um, see Erwin Chermarinsky, Constitutional Law Principles and Policies, 846, um, third edition from 2006. Lawrence, more than any other case in American history, recognizes that sexual activity is fundamental aspect of personhood and that it is entitled to constitutional protection. Lawrence, however, did not stand alone. As the court noted, it merely recognized and articulated a decades old emerging awareness that liberty gives substantial protection to adult persons in deciding how to conduct their private lives in matters pertaining to sex. Lawrence 539, um, the New York statute fails to recognize the right to privacy by imposing a wholesale prohibition on intercourse. Pursuant to the terms of that statute, one's disclosure that he, she has a STD is not enough. Consent by one's partner is not enough and well-recognized protective steps are not enough. The law as written requires that one who has an STD engage in complete abstinence. That is not and cannot be constitutional. Indeed, Lawrence confirmed a dimension of freedom that allows individuals to engage in intimate association without criminal liability um, over... Oberge Fell versus Hodges, 135 Supreme Court, um, 2584 at 2600. The statute cannot be read in any manner other than to prescribe a wholesale prohibition. It does not have any qualifiers. It does not have any contingency. It only prohibits, nor can it be saved by judicial construction or interpretation. The law does not permit us to take a common sense look at the statute and read into it things that are not there, such as a requirement that there be disclosure for knowing consent or even that there be consent. On its face, the law is invalid and cannot be the footing for a state law violation RICO predicate. For conclusion, accordingly, any allegations that are dependent upon this law in count one must be stricken and the remaining counts that rely upon the allegation must be dismissed. So I was just really confused by um, the verbiage that he used in that motion. And so I went back and I pulled up the indictment. And let's see. Where did this start? Okay, so for Faith Rogers, it started with number 32 and it said the defendant committed the following acts, either one of which alone constitutes racketeering. Act 10, um, there was a 33 transportation on or about May 18, 2017 within the district, Eastern District of New York and elsewhere. Um, the defendant, together with others, did knowingly and intentionally transport an individual, um, Jane Doe number six, an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury in interstate commerce with intent that this such individual engage in sexual activity for which a person can be charged with a criminal offense to wit violations of New York Penal Law Section 120.20, uh, Reckless Endangerment, and New York Public Health Law Section 2307. 
Okay, so I guess they're saying, okay, I get it now, I get it now. Um, then B was coercion and enticement, and this was number 34 on the indictment. And this was May 18, 2017, within the Eastern District of New York and elsewhere, together with others, did knowingly and intentionally persuade, induce, entice, and coerce an individual, Jane Doe number six, to travel in interstate commerce to engage in sexual activity for which a person, and then it goes through all the penal codes again. And then Racketeering Act number 11, uh, Forced Labor, number 35 on or about January 13, 2018, within the Central District of California and elsewhere, the defendant together with others did knowingly and intentionally obtain the labor and services of a person to wit Jane Doe number six by means of force, threats of force, physical restraint and threats of physical restraint to that person or another person by means of serious harm and threats of serious harm to that person or another person and by means of a scheme plan and pattern intended to cause such person to believe that if that person did not perform such labor and services, such person would suffer serious harm and physical restraint and a combination of such means in violation of Title 18. And then Racketeering Act 12, um, Man Act, Jane Doe number six, and this is number 36. It says the defendant committed the following acts, either one of which alone constitutes Racketeering Act 12, um, A, transportation. And then it just basically repeats the same thing over and over, but it's giving um, the different dates. This was February 2nd, 2018. Um, coercion and enticement the same day in New York. Um, Man Act Count Two. Um, this one says on or about May 18, 2017, within the Eastern District of New York. The defendant also, together with others, did knowingly and intentionally transport an individual. Um, in interstate commerce with intent that such individual engage in sexual activity for which a person can be charged. So it's basically um, saying the same thing over just for a different day, May 18, 2017, um, February 2nd, 2018. Um, February 2nd, 2018. And it's basically the same charges over and over again. So yeah, I guess I can see after reading those again, how they would try to apply that law. And then I had this article, and I think this was also from Jason um, Mesner. And he was actually saying that this law was outdated and had to do with um, the law it was something about, oh, it said the law dates to 1943 and was intended to prevent the spread of syphilis and gonorrhea to members of the military during World War II, according to a 2017 memo from the New York State Department of Health. The department believes the statute does not apply to people who know they are infected and reveal that information to their sex partners, the memo states. And it says, according to that law, one's disclosure that he, she has an SCD is not enough, consent by one's partner is not enough, and well-recognized protective steps are not enough. And um, that was part of the motion that was filed. Then it goes on to say that they didn't reveal the name, but everybody knows that it's Faith Rogers because she was the one that um, filed the lawsuit that's currently um, in, in civil court right now. And then this was some other information. This was just some random information. It says, as a general rule, no, you do not have an obligation to tell your partner if you have a sexually transmitted disease. Um, the, there aren't any federal or state laws making it illegal for you to not tell a partner about an SCD you may have. Laws on the topic vary from state to state. That being said, it is typically illegal civilly and criminally to knowingly or recklessly transmit an STD. 
Telling someone you have an STD is not the same obligation as knowingly transmitting an STD. Specifically, some states have laws that require you to tell certain people if you are HIV positive. And then um, it's a civil lawsuits. In many states, if you don't tell a partner about an STD and your partner contracts the disease, you could face a civil lawsuit. STDs often require medical treatment to cure, and some like HIV, AIDS, and herpes are incurable and can require lifelong medical treatment. Even if a victim's damages aren't high in physical forms or in physical terms, their emotional trauma and humiliation are enough to entitle them to compensation in some states. And then in New York, the law states that a person has a duty to warn this or his or her partner about an STD. Why? Because the law assumes that individuals would not have sex if they knew about the disease beforehand. However, whether that is truly an accurate assumption depends on the person. Therefore, a person not warning his or her sexual partner and transmitting an STD is considered guilty of battery. Um, typically, your partner could sue you for negligence or personal injury and if you lose you may have to pay monetary damages for your partner's costs therapy medical treatment loss of time at work etc and injuries um, then it says criminal charges criminal charges one second <clears throat> Criminal charges may ensue if you do not say anything to your partner. In states like California, it is a felony for anyone who knows they are infected with HIV AIDS to engage in unprotected sexual activity with a partner, not tell the partner about the HIV status, engage in unprotected sexual activity for the purpose of infecting the partner with HIV, secure and confidential, um, STD testing services, um, the fastest results possible available in one to two days. And let's see. Oh, and then STD laws in New York. I don't know why this page keeps getting away from me. Um, STD laws in New York, sexually transmitted diseases, law falls under the tort law. Generally, a tort occurs when the act of a person, whether intentional or careless, causes an injury to another person's or property. If it is proven that a tort has occurred, the party who committed the act may be held liable for monetary damages to the victim. New York health law requires an individual who is carrying an STD to disclose this fact to a partner prior to engaging in any sexual contact. Specifically, the law states any person who knowingly himself or herself to be infected with an infectious venereal disease has sexual intercourse with another shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. In other words, failure to disclose knowledge of an STD to a sexual partner is a crime. While the law does not express a specific list of venereal diseases, the most commonly accepted relating to this law include herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, hepatitis, HIV, AIDS, and other contagious diseases spread through sexual contact. While someone found guilty of violating this law would be charged with a misdemeanor, Punishment includes up to one year in jail and a monetary fine of up to $1,000. If a defendant is found guilty of reckless endangerment, which is conduct that creates a serious risk of death and shows indifference for human life, the crime becomes a felony. Punishment includes a jail sentence of up to seven years and a fine of up to $5,000. Um, then it goes on and says, STD laws, New York, things to consider. STD laws. 
Thank you.